This is the Bring Back Soul Music Podcast, the only podcast devoted to making soul music relevant again. Let's get started with your host, Todd Woodson. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Bring Back Soul Music Podcast. My special, special guest today is a three-time Grammy-nominated artist from Harlem, USA, Mr. Ryan Shaw. Mr. Shaw, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing pretty good, man. Doing pretty good. How are you? Good, good. Welcome to the Bring Back Soul Music Podcast. Ah, thanks for having me. No problem. Um, glad to have you on the show, man. We have been kind of missing each other a little bit the past week or so, but I'm glad we finally got you on the show. Um, you have a new uh, album out called Imagining Marvin, which I think is great, by the way. We'll talk <laughs> about that uh, a little bit because I have a lot of questions about that. Uh, but before <laughs> we do, um, for those who don't know Mr. Ryan Shaw, tell us about yourself. Um, born and raised in Decatur, Georgia. I grew up um, pretty pretty strict Pentecostal background and um, end up eventually moving, uh, going on tour with Tyler Perry um, to do a show he had called, uh, I know I've been changed with like LaShawn Pays Rose and, um, and Nesby from Sounds of Blackness and Carl Pertile and all those guys. And then um, ended up staying in New York. And so I've been here ever since it's been about 20 years, 21 years now. Um, and yeah, that's I mean that's it in a in a brief in a nutshell. Southern boy, but now in the big city. <laughs> um, so you grew up in Georgia. Um, did you you say you grew up in a Pentecostal house? So, mm -hmm. so there was no secular music. So you don't even have to. Ask that. <laughs> that was my next question. No, because as a matter of fact, when I was when I was growing up, they until we until I like got my first um, what do you call Walkman. Okay. I'm dating myself, but yeah, when I got my first Walkman, uh, I'm making sure my phone is muted. When I got my first Walkman is when I re when I could actually like sneak and like listen to other radio stations, and, and my mother would be like, "What are you listening to?" And I'd be like, "Um, Jesus on the main line," <laughs> you know. But yeah, we, we there was no secular music in the house, and we couldn't even listen to it really on our own. I mean, I wasn't in a bubble, so if I was like at the supermarket, I would hear it. And so a lot of my soul music or secular music came from me. Hearing the voices, so I knew voices and I knew songs from like being in a grocery store at the mall or with my father who would play. I mean, my father had a janitorial service and so we had to work for him on the weekend. And so on the weekend, he would be, we would be cleaning all these buildings for hours and he would just play regular radio, V103 in Atlanta, which is what, what my station was. Uh, so we used to listen to V103 and I would, that's when I would get my quick study on other voices that weren't gospel. But yeah, that was, yeah, it wasn't a thing. <laughs> when did you... Uh... When did you decide that you wanted to be a uh, singer songwriter, be an artist, I should say? Um, a singer, I've, I've known that since I was five. Mm. I've always wanted to be a singer. It sounds like I'm pretty much taught. Uh, at the church I grew up in, they uh, had a thing, well, it's really weird. You know, people down south, they they say things, it's the, it's the twang, it's the, it's the way they we speak down there. So a lot of things that I thought they were saying growing up, they weren't saying it, and not until I was an adult and really realized what was actually happening. So growing up, they had the, the, the Sunbeam Choir. And I was like, I never knew what a Sunbeam was. I'm like, what is a Sunbeam? And it's Sunbeam. But just when they said, oh, we're gonna call it the Sunbeam Choir, and they're gonna sing. And I thought they were saying Sunbeam until I was like 20. And so I finally figured that out. But it's from the age you could talk, they put you in the Sunbeam Choir and the sun being quiet. And so um, I had my first solo at like five years old. Uh, and it was a song called I've Been Redeemed. And I remember I just had a short solo and I, and I got the solo because I was, I could hear harmony from very young. I was like five at the time. And they were singing the chorus. She was teaching us the chorus and I was singing a harmony, I guess. This is what she told me when I was older. And she was like, she stopped everybody. She's like, who's singing this note? And, and I was like scared and I was like, me? 
And she's like, who taught you that? And I was like, nobody is missing. And she's like, what do you mean it's missing? I was like, everybody's singing one note and that part was missing. And then she was like, come here. <laughs> and then I went to her and then she was like, sing this part. So she gave me the lead and it was, God gave me a song that the angels cannot sing. I've been washed in the blood. And then the goons came in and they were singing behind. I called them the goons because they couldn't even sing, but we were all five, but. <laughs> Okay. So that, that's what I knew from, from then that I wanted to be okay. singing. I got yeah. you. Um, full disclosure, I sung in our church's Sunbeam Choir as well. Uh, as kid. Um, yeah. Now, were your parents, um, they sound like they were um, very traditional, uh, gospel or traditionalist, I should say, and no secular music in the house. Um, were they a big part of the church? Was your dad like a minister or? Well, I kind of used to say that my, my mom was the church mother and my dad was the devil. My dad didn't go to church. <laughs> he wasn't the devil, but he, he didn't go to church. And it was okay. weird. Like they have a history. Like when they first, my father's one who brought my mother to the church and then he left before I was born. Okay. And so he, my whole life, I've never known him to be in church. So I say, my mother is the church mother. My father's the devil. Gotcha. So. My mother had to say on what the kids did. So it was very, it was pretty strict. Like we didn't even really go anywhere. It took me like, I had to like beg and cry and plead to even go like spend the night at my cousin's house. And I'm talking about her sister's child. Wow. So it was pretty, it was pretty strict. And, you know, it protected us in a way, but in a way it was like, you know, a bit, you know, suffocated, but. Okay. You know. Um, now you're, you have siblings? Yes. There's a lot of us. All right. uh, eight of us. Well, two have passed, but there was originally eight, eight siblings, eight okay. of them. seven boys, one girl. Oh, wow. Ain't that crazy. Wow. Okay. Um, now, do they do music as well or is it just you? Uh, my baby brother, who was who passed a couple of years ago, um, he was actually a really great singer. He, he, we actually have almost the same voice, but I have more range. Um, his recorded voice, my mother said she couldn't even tell the difference between him and I. Cause I, I wrote a song and I had him sing the demo and then we played it for my mom. She was like, is that you Ryan? I was like, no, that's Dante. She was like, are you kidding me? Don't be trying to fool me. I'm like, no, that's Dante. And then my brother above him, Loratus, he lives in the Bronx now. He moved up to New York too. He's a great singer and a dope songwriter. And he's you know doing his thing. He don't want to be an artist anymore, but he's a really dope songwriter too and a great singer. Okay. Then the rest of them, we all had to sing. Right. But you wanna, Steven can sing a little bit. Corey, I don't know if he fools around, but he hated it all the time. But and my sister Misha loves to sing, but she's a little tone deaf, and I know she's hearing this and she's mad. But <laughs> she's she's a little tone. She's a little tone deaf. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> eight kids sound like a fun family to be a part of. <laughs> oh man, we had a blast. Oh, uh, we had a blast, and it was it's really well. Growing up at younger age, I said before I was thirteen, we fought a lot. Okay. But then, like after that, you know, I got. I got saved and like dedicated my life to Lord at like 13, no, 15. And from then on, a lot of the anger that I had when I was younger sort of left. So we got along and even to this day, like when I would go to Atlanta, even like years ago, um, I would go home and everybody would like move into my sister's house, all my cousins, and, like Ryan's home, we go into Shea Misha's and everybody would like move into my cousin's house and into my sister's house until I left. Like they would all just come and we would hang out, but I would hang out from my brothers from the youngest to the oldest. We were all very close, all of us. Oh, so you. it's never, uh, and that's rare in families that big because you always got somebody who don't talk to somebody or somebody's angry, but we're all pretty close to be so large. It's a pretty, very close family. Yeah. All right. Um, now, where did you, um, how did you get your start? Um, and let me ask you before you answer that, um, why, why did you take this route versus say the gospel route? Um, I mean, growing up, I thought it was going to be gospel. I, I didn't, I, I mean, it's, it's weird. In a way, I used to have this dream. I'll put it this way. I used to have this this vision. It wasn't even a dream, it was a vision. Like I wouldn't be sleep. I would be in between sleep. I guess I would call it a vision more because I don't think I was really dreaming. But I would have this vision like once or twice a year, ever since I'm maybe five or six years old. And I would see myself on stage singing and I would see people in the, I would see this, a crowd. I couldn't see the end of the crowd. And I would get this range of emotions. Some people would be like laughing and some people would be dancing and people would be like waving their, like a candle or whatever. 
thing they had to make light or phone or whatever it was. And um, well, I'm, oh, there was probably candles, but <laughs> but they would be waving their things, and uh, and and it's like I would see that twice a year, so I already I already knew what where I was supposed to be doing. But the weird thing about it, I never heard sound. It was never sound to it. So in my mind, I always assumed that I was singing gospel and I was going to be a big gospel artist because that's the way I was raised and, you know, and that. And then when I moved and started singing with Tyler Perry and got to New York, I really wanted to do Broadway. I moved to New York to do Broadway, which definitely is not gospel. So, you know, and then I, you know, I learned part of the way, the way I grew up was, you know, and it's not even really what they taught. It's when you're at a certain age and things are so strict, it's the things that you assume about what you're taught. Right. It's the thing that, that I found out more than anything. And so, um, yeah, I just started singing secular music because I need to pay my rent in New York, and you can't pay your rent in New York with gospel. <laughs> and only so many Sunday brunches you can do. And so I started singing in wedding bands and stuff like that, and, and like doo wop groups. And, you know, I had to pay my bills, and I wasn't home anymore. And I, I didn't feel personally that me singing secular music removed any part of God from me or from my life. So I, I came to peace with that, and I was like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And it's crazy because when I when I headlined the Montreal Jazz Fest for the second time, and they rarely have an artist back two years in a row. The first time was when I first came out and they had me back. No, they had me back a year, skipped a year. But then the next year I went back and I didn't know I was headlining the main stage because we were just running around. They said, in the early parts of your career, it's really weird because you might go somewhere and do like a, a, a gig at a bar of like 500 people, or maybe 150 people for like two grand. And then the next thing you're doing like the Super Bowl party for Samsung for 30 grand the very next night. And then the next night you're doing a little show for 5,000, just to get gas money to get back across the country. And so in the earlier parts of my career, when you're just like blowing up and things are happening, it's like, it's like a weird thing. Like you don't have a set guarantee. It's like you get what you can take and you just keep trying to build and you grind it and you know, you do it the real organic way. And so that's kind of um, where I was. So we had just left some, I think we were actually left um we were in here in new york i think it was steven talk house in montauk and that's a small club we did like i think we did two nights in a row there but it was a great show small club 150 i mean maybe 250 to 500 people and then the next night was montreal we drove from there went straight up to montreal the next day and got there late because we hit traffic and hit the border and the border in canada is kind of crazy so uh, they pulled us over. Oh, you're a band, and they want to take everything off the bus, and you know, it was just like looking for weed. I was like, I didn't even drink at the time. I was like, I don't know what y'all are looking for. Nothing. You're not gonna find anything. And so, uh, but actually, I found out that my guitar player did smoke, and he had weed inside of an apple, <laughs> hidden inside of an apple. We're not gonna talk about that. But uh, <laughs> I found that out later. But we were going to Montreal, and they just pushed me out onto the stage. And they was like, you don't have time for a sound check. You're like, your set is about to start in like two minutes. So they, my band went out first, and then they did their little intro song, and then they pushed me out through this curtain. And I'm in the middle of the square downtown Montreal, and the stage is set up like at the corner of the street. And so as far as you can see this way and as far as you can see this way are just people, like 40,000 people in the square. And it took me by surprise because it was my first time actually headlining you know, that many people at night. Because, you know, you start the festivals in the daytime, it's, right. it's only 20,000 people there. But at night, people keep coming in, coming in, coming in. It's like, it was like, you couldn't see the end of the people. And so I was turning around to my band and my drummer was like, it's happening, <laughs> it's happening. And I was like, okay. And so I turned around, we did the show, killed. And then I went home and then went back to the hotel that night and woke up in the morning with showering, getting ready to leave. And then that vision I had flashed back into me. And it's, it was that moment was when it happened. I couldn't see the end of the people, and but there was sound this time clearly because it was me being, and it just let me know that since I was a child, I knew where I was supposed to be doing. you know. And I guess God never let me hear sound because if I heard sound in the vision, I rebuked it. I would bind you, Satan. This is not what I'm supposed to be doing. And so he never let me hear sound until it was fulfilled what that was supposed to be. And so that's, that's, how, it, that's how it started. Okay. And you said you did that two years in a row to had you back yeah, they say they really have an artist back, but I was in the tent the first time and they were like, we're gonna, we, we asked you. But it, that happened to me twice when I first started. It was from that and also when I did the, uh, you know, they have Summer Stage here, but Summer Stage is the big thing they have in Central Park where they bring all the, you know, global citizens and everybody comes in and perform, you know, all the big artists. Well, they have a fundraiser for that every year. And they had me do the fundraiser one year. And then a year and a half later, two years later, they invited me back for the fundraiser the next year. And they were like, you know, we never have an artist do the fundraiser twice. 
but you were such a big hit a couple of years ago, they wanted you back again. And there was like, that only happened twice. And the only other artist that we've asked back twice has been Stevie Wonder. <laughs> I was like, oh, really? <laughs> so that was kind of cool too. But, um, but you know, they may have had other artists back, but that was at the time I did, it was 2009, eight or nine, I think it was. But before then, I was the second artist in the history of Summer Stage, which has been going on for decades, uh, to actually perform twice at the thing. And same with Montreal Jazz Fest. But, you know, those little cool honors make it kind of cool. So I'm, I'm let you know you, what you're doing is, is no matter what, what you feel about what you're doing, that you, you, you're doing something right and you're in the right place. So Yeah, absolutely. Um, wow. Uh, congratulations on all your success, by the way. Uh, thank you. Um, let me back up just a little bit. You said that you um, you toured with um, Tyler Perry. Yeah. How did you um, How did you come across Tyler Perry? I know he's from uh, Georgia, but how did that all? How did you get on? Yeah. Well, when I when I first left Atlanta, I, I decided to leave corporate America and, and start singing. And so I was doing another play first. We you know we called the Chitlin Circuit. And so I was doing um, a play actually called uh, A Good Man is Hard to Find, Part Two. So he was hard to find the first time, and now he's even harder to find because there's a part because <laughs> there's a part two. And so it's a good man and hard to find part two. And I had some friends in there that actually are with Tyler now, like Pinky and uh, some other people who are still with Tyler um, and have you know done his shows. But when I got back to to Atlanta after that tour, which was a terrible tour, and they didn't really take care of us that well, and we were like boycotting in the lobby, um, they were like, "Well, Tyler Perry." Is, is and he wasn't Tyler Tyler then he was Tyler I mean he was big then he was the biggest probably name in in that circuit for you know gospel stage plays but but he wasn't like Tyler Tyler he was in the household name yet and so uh, they like Tyler's auditioning for his new play uh, uh, I know I've been changed and so I just went to the audition and I sang and so I was I think I was nineteen at the time and so he had to get permission from my mother mama Shaw. i promise you i'll take care of him and she's like you bring my son back in all that kind of craziness and so we actually that's how i got to new york doing that show with tyler so we were out on the road for probably about a year and a half and the last city we did was new york we played the beacon supposed to be for two weeks we ended up closing early at during that time when i found out we were closing i was like well i always wanted to do broadway i went to performing arts high school one year as a child in the eighth grade my mother pulled me out, said it was too worldly. She didn't want me taking ballet and none of that stuff. And so she was like, that's too worldly. You coming out. And so I ended up graduating from regular high school. But I'm like, I'm in New York now. And so this is my big chance to do Broadway if I'm going to try to do it. And so I called my mom. And I was like, Mom, I'm not, I'm not coming back. And she was like, what do you mean you're not coming back? You better get your behind on that plane. You don't know about it. You ain't got no money. What do you think you're doing? I was like, well, I, I don't know. And I don't know what I was thinking at the time. I wasn't afraid. I didn't have any money. I had my last check from Tyler. And... And I sent half of that back to my brother who had taken over, who I spoke, who I had spoken to, and he was taking over my um, my lease for my for my Saturn. Um, and then, and that was it. And I had eight hundred dollars left after that, and I was here in New York. I had my CDs and I had my clothes, and that's all I needed. And um, and that's another long story, but uh, yeah. But the problem with all this was I didn't tell Tyler I was staying, so he had to call my mother. And was like, Mushaw, we don't know where Ryan is, but we are going to miss the flight. We have to come back. I don't know. But she had already spoken to me. So she knew where I was, but he didn't. And um, so, you know, I haven't really worked with him since. We're still friends and we, we communicate, but I don't think that that ended. <laughs> I was young. Come on, Tyler. We can get over it. No, I'm just kidding. No, we're cool. But uh, but that that was um, that was the separation. And I stayed in New York and, you know, he went back and, you know, hit his, you know, built his empire. And, you know, and I'm still here building mine. We'll continue our episode after this message. Are you looking for a reliable way to transfer money to family and friends? Check out the Cash App. It's safe, easy, and convenient. Just download the app from the Apple or Google Play Store and start receiving and sending money in a few minutes. Sign up today and receive $5. And don't forget to use our referral code. BGRCWQX. Swag at shop.bringbacksoulmusic.com. Now, back to our conversation. Yeah, I hear you, man. So, uh, <laughs> when did you, um, now, imagining Marvin, um, what number uh, album is this for you? It's the third full album and the fourth project. Um, 
the first project, This Is Ryan Shaw, was on Columbia in 2007. Uh, then I did an EP because it was a weird situation, but I just did an EP because I had me, I was between labels and the EP was called In Between. I was in between labels, in between um, records and in between everything, probably relationship at the time too. I was in between everything. And so I did an EP called In Between and the label, I'm trying to make a long story short, the label that ended up that, so when I signed to Columbia, my contract ended up being inherited by another company called Razor and Tie. And then, so something happened with Razor and Tie and they didn't necessarily want to fulfill all of the contract that they inherited. So we sort of forced them to drop me. So they dropped me from the label and then they announced in their publicity meeting the next week that they had, that I was no longer on the label and the whole office went crazy. So then they came back the next week and tried to re-sign me <laughs> because we're like, you can't do that. How could you do that? It's crazy. And so they came back to try to re-sign me. I had just finished this EP and I was like, well, I'm releasing an EP. And they was like, well, no, we don't want to release anything that's not on us, on our label. And I was like, but it's been too long and I'm not going to go through another year of negotiating. I'll put this out and then I'll do another record with you guys. And they was like, well, if you put, if you release this, then the deal's off the table. And I was like, well, take it off the table because y'all didn't, y'all been running games anyway. So, so that's what happened with that. And so the EP came out and still garnered me a, a second Grammy nomination, thank the Lord, but um, independent. And then the second full album was called Real Love, uh, all done with my producer at the time, Jimmy Braylauer, who did all of the music prior to Imagine Martin. He and uh, Neil Posner, also known as Johnny Gale, um, great guys. We did a bunch of great music. And so the second album, the last album I did with him was called Real Love. And uh, that was in, I think, 2012. And now, you know, and so from 2012 to 2020, I'd be taking these long hiatuses and it's not, it's, it's, it's rude. Uh, <laughs> it's rude for me and for my bank account. But, um, but I don't know, just things just get crazy at times and you just have to like take a step back and then regroup. Uh, I don't plan on taking any long hiatuses anymore, but, um, but yeah. And so this is the fourth project. Okay. Um... So tell us about Imagine A Marvel. Uh, let me ask you a question before. Well, I'm gonna let you talk about it. Go ahead and tell us about Imagine A Marvel. Well, Imagine A Marvel was sort of started as um, a conversation with me and my manager. I had just, I had gotten back from Chicago uh, doing Jesus Christ Superstar, um, where I played Judas, which was another, whole another great experience. Uh, and I was like, well, I really feel like it's time for me to go back into the music industry because from 2013, after the last, you know, record and Grammy nomination, I was doing Broadway. So that's what happened with those, that period between I was doing Motown the musical. I went to London to perform on the West End and Thriller Live, which is a Michael Jackson musical. And I came back to the States and went to Chicago to do the big um, U U.S. launch of the U.K. production that won all the Olivier's of Jesus Christ Superstar. And then I got back and I was like, well, it's time for me to do music. I missed the stage. I missed doing my own music. You know, it's good. I can bring other people's stuff to life, but it's time for me to bring my stuff back to life. And so we were talking, so what is the hook? Like, what do we do? And I was like, I don't want to do any more covers because my first record had covers on it. Second record was mostly originals, but still covers. And I don't want to be pegged as a covers artist, but what is the hook? It's really hard to do a bunch of original music and get it heard. And so we're trying to figure out things and went through a bunch of lists. And then she was kind of just Googling. She was like, oh, you know what? This year is actually Marvin Gaye's 80th birthday. And then like all these lights went off in my head. And I was like, wow. I realized Marvin had been a big component of my career because uh, when I first moved to New York in 2008, uh, I was going to all the open mics. I was asking people, where do you go to be seen, to, you know, to you know, get work for singing and stuff? It's like, go to the open mics, go to the underground, go to Cafe Wa, go to, at the time it was a place called Jazz and Wilson's or Chaz and Wilson's, Jazz and Wilson's on 79th Street, go to, go to uh, Ashford and Simpson Sugar Bar and go to Nails, like all these places, amazing places that you can go to, to be seen and be heard. And the underground was one of the biggest places you could go with Ron Grant, who was, you know, the late, great Ron Grant. And um, so I would go down, but the first song that I sang, that got me noticed. I sang Everything Must Change for a while, but was, but when I first, people stopped and was like, oh, it was what's going on. And at that time, when you had a song that the people knew you by, it was sort of your song. So you just stuck with that song. So for two years, every time I went out to sing, which was like three or four times a week, I just sang what's going on for like two years. So that was Marvin. Then, you know, you fast forward into, you know, Broadway. I was in Motown the Musical. I actually played Stevie Wonder. 
But I understudied Marvin and I went on for Marvin quite a few times and had to dive into his story, into his persona and also, you know, bring that to life. And my third Grammy nomination from the from the uh, Real Love album was for my cover of The Beatles Yesterday. But my version is heavily based on Marvin Gaye's sort of obscure version of that same song. And so when she said that, I was like, Marvin has been like, been pointed like bullet points throughout my whole career. And I was like, and if it's 80th birthday, I would, I could do a Marvin tribute album, but it can't be all covers because I don't want to do a covers album. I want to do a tribute. And I don't want his original songs to actually be a remake of his original song. I want them to be, I want people to hear the record and I want them to say, wow, this is good. Oh, wait, that's Marvin. And so last year before the pandemic hit, we, this whole album was a year behind because of the pandemic. But the year before that, we actually, I did a concert at the, at the cutting room in New York City. Um, and it was a sold out performance of Imagining Marvin. I needed to make sure that my arrangements of the songs or the ideas that I had about the original songs worked or fit as fit as comfortable on me as they did on him when he did them and also to see if my original music could stand up next to a marvin gay to an ashford and simpson song you know what i mean to make sure that you know to see if it could stand all if it all made sense and so that's how it was birthed okay um well i had a chance to listen to it earlier and um yeah i don't know man um it's kind of hard to tell you and marvin apart <laughs> uh, I was so impressed. Um, and let me just back up and say that um, not only do you sound like Marvin on your um, album, you also sound a lot like Sam Cooke. I think the ah. first song that I heard, I was like, I know this is called Imagining Marvin, but that sounded like Sam Cooke. Um, but great, great job on Imagining Marvin. Um, Awesome, awesome job. Um, well, so Marvin is. I know. I'm sorry, go ahead. When people ask me like, who is my favorite singer of all time? It is Sam Cooke. It's Sam Cooke and Donny Hathaway are my two. I can't separate the two. I always go, well, Sam, or maybe that's so it's Sam and Donny. So when you say Sam, he's definitely like my spirit animal. If you want to say like my spirit musician, yeah. So Sam is always going to be somewhere sneaking around. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh. Um, Sam, Marvin, and uh, Donnie. I mean, you can't get any better than that. So <laughs> I mean, those are three heavyweights uh, and three of my favorites as well. Um, so before, you know, pre-pandemic, um, what's been the reception like for Imagining Marvin? The reception has been kind of overwhelming. It's been really, really great. Like people that I know in the industry, like, personal calls, the night that the record actually came out, um, from me being in New York and, you know, singing at the Sugar Bar, I, Nick and Val, Nick and Ashton and Val Simpson sort of became my industry parents. And so when I first thought of the concept, I went to Val and I had done a demo of I Want You, not the version that's on the record, but it was a, a, a slightly different version than that. But to make sure, and I said, I want to play something for you. Me and my manager went over. She's like, come on, let me hear it. I'm going to play something for you. I want you to let me know if I'm onto something or if I need to just shut it down. I know she would tell me the truth. And so I played her the demo and she paused and she said, there's something there. And I said, okay. And so we went and we finished the record up. And so when the record was done and mixed and mastered, I, I um, when I moved back from London, I never got another car. So when I like to listen to music, I used to listen, I had a, before I used to lease Honda CRVs. And so I'm used to hearing music in a CRV. So I, I did like a zip car, I rented a CRV and I was just renting for like three hours and I was driving down the West Side of Highway, and it was like maybe one o'clock in the morning, and I was like, "Let me call Val and see if she's up." And I was, and so she actually answered the phone. I was like, "Hey, Val, what are you doing?" I was like, "I actually just got my masters back, and I'm actually listening through the whole album in sequence in the car, and I'm just, I took a chance to see if you're up. I know sometimes you're a night owl. I want to see if you, if you're up, if you want to like, you know, listen to them with me." And she's like, "Where are you?" I said, "I'm on the West Side Highway in like 59th Street," and she's like, "How soon could you be here?" And I was like, "You know, maybe 10, 15 minutes." She was like. Come on. And so I went over to the house and she got in the car and we masked up and we drove down into like uh until like all the way down to like uh City Hall and back and listened to the whole project. And um, you know, between songs she would ask a question, who was that? What was this? What was this? And who produces this with you? And then we so we went through the whole thing and got back to the house and she was like, 
this is worth me putting my clothes back on. <laughs> and then she said, but really, and she said, I don't know what you're going to do with all this. She said, but it's probably one of the most solid bodies of work that she's ever heard. Damn. And I said, oh, that you've ever heard? I mean, you wrote most of the iconic songs on the planet. And so the reception has been great. And, you know, and Valerie has been very supportive. And, you know, she wrote Strong Man Can with me. Um, uh, and so it's just been... The reception has been really great and the other friends calling me just saying you know that just how brilliant they think the record is and i actually did a uh, my first live performance was i took over the sugar bars open mic and um and uh asked valerie can i take over the open mic and pretty much make it like the album release party since we couldn't be around each other right. and so she was like well if you're gonna do the sugar bar i'm gonna come down so it was me and her only us masked up at the sugar bar and i performed the whole album except for one song because uh, we ran out of time. But I performed pretty much the whole record and all the artists that sang the open mic in between were people who, like my friends who sang background on the record and, you know, all those artists who have been closely connected and supported my journey. So it was, the whole night was about Imagine Marvin. And they surprised me and actually had Jan Gay on the Zoom and I didn't know she was there. And there's a battle, I got surprised for you and Jan Marvin's wife, ex-wife came on and she was like, I just think what you did was brilliant. I think calling it Imagining Marvin was a stroke of genius. And I think, and what you did, I could hear you and I could hear Marvin. And she was like, and, and it doesn't sound like you tried to be him, but I felt him and I really felt your own artistry as well. And she was like, congratulations. I think it's a, a great project. And so the reception, to get that reception from his estate is, you know, monumental because they don't approve of a lot of things that people try to do as far as Marvin is concerned. So the reception has been really, really awesome. Yeah, high praise indeed. Uh, congratulations. Um, wow. Um, so what's next for you? Um, you know, it's so weird because we're in this pandemic and I know you're, you're probably itching to get out there and perform and expose more people to it. But um, what, is the, what is the plan for um, 2021? Well, Everything is changing. I mean, we have shows set up towards the end of the year, um, but you know, we don't know if they're going to happen. That's, that's the craziest part. Is trying to figure it all out. Uh, we're trying to really strategically navigate the, you know, the uh, the streaming performance venues kind of happen. And the issue with those is that you know they're harder to monetize because they're not there's no geographical location to them. So like if you oversaturate, you can do three concerts and then everybody in the world has seen you, you know, or that's going to see or that wants to see, you know, so it's about strategically placing things. It's, it's a, it's a, it's exciting because it's like everyone now is sort of navigating this new territory, which sort of levels the playing field for a lot of artists. Um, but it's also very unnerving because a lot of times it doesn't, it equates to, it doesn't translate financially, we'll put it that way. Right. And so, you know, at this point, you know, you just gotta, it's just navigating it all is, is the, the biggest thing. Uh, but I'm definitely, hopefully, at some point, we'll be able to get out and perform. We're talking about venues coming back at, you know, 10%, 15% capacity kind of situations, which would be opportunities. You know, I think for me, I'm really focusing a lot on the, um, the sync side you know, trying to get the album placed, songs placed in film and television to get the visibility there because it's, it's difficult, you know, um, when you can't go out and, you know, organically build it how you're used to building it. Okay. Do you, um, I know you uh, you do theater as well, and I, I imagine theater will be back at some point. Do you uh, get to the point where, say, you know, I want to get back into theater, and then, like you said earlier, that you know, it's time for you to get back into the music. Um, it seems like you do a very good job on navigating the two. <laughs> yeah, it, it's 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 pretty cool. Cool. I think theater comes to me when it's time. Music is where I am. So I, I I'm open to do theater. I'm actually writing a musical actually with my with my New York sister Josette. We're actually writing a musical and it's really dope. Um, and then we we actually supposed to be taking some time doing this pandemic to finish up a few more songs so that we can do a reading. It's probably gonna be a Zoom reading at this point, but um, when theater calls, it'll it'll come for me. Uh, I don't quite go out and be like the, that theater guy, but I love the stage and, you know, that all started back with, you know, with Tyler and 
for good things hard to find part two. So that'll always be a part of my life, I think, in some capacity. Um, but music and creating my own music and putting my own voice and my own perspective out is 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 the is the focus, yeah. Okay. Um, before we get out of here, uh, let people know how they can reach you on uh, social media. Um, everything on social media is this is Ryan Shaw. Uh, so this is Ryan Shaw, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, I'm on TikTok because they told me I have to be, but I've only done one TikTok and it's terrible. So I'm not sure, but I'm on there as the same thing. This is Ryan Shaw. <laughs> we'll figure it out. TikTok is very new for me and I don't really have time to be putting out all this content while I'm trying to make a record. I was like, it's a lot. So, you know, right. you know I think yeah. as it grows and, you know, things started. You have a website too, right? Yes, and my website is ryanshaw.com, just my name.com, and all the information is there. If you don't remember the rest, just go to just Google Ryan Shaw. The website is the first thing that will come up, and all the social media links are there for you to follow and click and like and subscribe and all that. Okay, and where and all can that jazz is probably you know. coming out. <laughs> and where can we pick up Imagine Me Marva? Imagine Marva, wherever you listen to music, all digital streamings from, you know, Amazon, Deezer, Tidal, Spotify, Pandora, everywhere. And if you need, and if you want a physical of the project, go to BroadwayRecords.com, and you can order it through the distributor there. BroadwayRecords.com, and okay, and we'll put all that information in the show notes, and also on our website at BringBackSoulMusic.com. One more quick question here, uh, Ryan, about imagining Marvin. Do you have a favorite uh, Marvin Gaye song? Um, my favorite Marvin Gaye song. It's actually the shadow of your smile. And it's not one that he's written, but it's one that he's sang. It was released after his passing on on the Vulnerable album. Um, from everything that I've talked to, like Barry Gordy about from doing Motown the musical and you know him being active there and us getting to ask him anything, you know the the stories he would tell us about Marvin and how Marvin would like he was always wanting to do something different. He was always doing, he was always reinventing himself. And even outside of music, he was a boxer, he you know, wanted to be an astronaut, all those kind of things, whatever. But uh, but one thing he really wanted to be as a singer was he wanted to, like his heart was like to be a crooner, the American songbook and to like be with the Rat Pack and you know, hang out, you know, be with Sammy and all of those guys and uh, old Blue Eyes. So when you hear, if you haven't heard the Vulnerable album, I would say get the Vulnerable album and listen to it. and. How he approaches the American Songbook is so Marvin, but you can tell his whole heart was in it. Every fiber of his being was in that. And when I first heard Shadow of Your Smile, it literally stopped me in my tracks and gave me like goosebumps. And I was like, this is the most beautiful thing. And you can hear other versions of Shadow of Your Smile, but until you hear Marvin do it, you haven't really heard it. Um, and that's the one song on the record that I actually sang just like Marvin did. I didn't actually, I don't think I even added an extra note or anything. I literally just sang the damn song. <laughs> Marvin sang the song because that's that's how much that song moves me and how he did it. It was the one song I didn't feel a need to reinterpret. I just like, or add anything to like in Grapevine, I added this big vamp at the end that Marvin doesn't do, but I needed to, you know, that was part of me making that me, but I feel like the shadow of your smiles where me and Marvin met and really connected. And so that, that, um, that meeting intersection didn't need to be altered at all. So I just sang it how he sang it. Okay. And try to connect to it in my own way, but yeah, it was just what Marvin did. Okay, I'm doing some research on. Um, this is kind of a side note on some of the best duets um, in history, or mm -hmm. at least soul music. And I didn't realize doing the research that Marvin was such a. He was also a great songwriter. Oh my um, God! Yeah. Yeah, I didn't realize. I know a lot of the stuff that. Uh, he and Tammy Terrell did was written by Ashford and Simpson, but mm -hmm. he also wrote some incredible songs too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I didn't, I didn't know that during the research. So Marvin was, uh, Marvin was all that, right? Yeah. And a bag of chips. <laughs> I was gonna say. But his favorite song that he wrote, he actually sang it too, though, but I don't think it was very popular. Holy, Holy, Holy that Aretha did when Aretha re did the remake of it. Well, technically it's a remake. Yeah. Cause he, he did actually sing it when he, and, and wrote it, but that Holy, Holy is a, beast on the song <laughs> yeah okay. well that on that note anything else you want to add mr shaw yeah i, I just want to thank everyone in advance for the support of the record um yeah i mean I, i'm 
we're trying to build this. And so, you know, as you hear it, if you love it, spread the word. Uh, it's more and more difficult every year as technology advances to get the word out. And people message me all the time. You should be bigger than you are. You should be bigger than you are. You should be blah, 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 blah. And you know, I'm like, well, I'm working, I'm building. And so I think for people to speak about it. So if you hear about it and you love it, tell somebody, share it to as many people as you can, because that's the only way it's going to happen is to get the word out. So absolutely, I'll leave, I'll leave it with that. <laughs> And we'll do our part too. Uh, we do a profile. Uh, you'll see the profile coming up this Friday. Mm. Actually, when this comes out, it'll be Friday. So on yeah, our right. website at bringbacksoulmusic.com. And we'll also have all the links to um, Ryan's information as well. Uh, Mr. Shaw, it's been a great pleasure talking to you, sir. Um, Thank you. I'm glad we finally got to get together and do yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad we did too. Uh, you know, Thing, things happen is life so yeah yeah uh, it is what it is but i appreciate you taking the time today uh and good luck with everything man and keep us posted i definitely will and hopefully we can breathe all the same air and you can come see it live absolutely i can't wait man i can't wait till this whole thing is over and get out there and see some a little more concerts and i know all the stuff that we uh that used to do i mean uh the instagram stuff and the facebook live stuff is cool but nothing like yeah. being out a concert, yeah. right? You can't absorb the energy like you can in a room. Exactly. Those magical moments that are created each concert is, yeah. 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 All right. That's Mr. Ryan Shaw, and we'll be right back. Calling all lovers of soul music. The time to make soul music relevant again is now. You've been listening to the Bring Back Soul Music podcast with Todd Woodson. If you enjoyed today's show, be sure to tell a friend. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing to our newsletter at bringbacksoulmusic.com. Well, that's our show for today. I'd like to thank my special guest, Mr. Ryan Shaw. You can find out more about Ryan on his website at ryanshaw.com. Don't forget, you can listen to the Bring Back Soul Music podcast on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and Pandora. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel at Bring Back Soul Music TV. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at comments at bringbacksoulmusic.com. And don't forget to check out all our merch at shop.bringbacksoulmusic.com. We call that the Soul Shop. I'm Todd Woodson. Thank you for joining us. See you next week.